So let's see if we can do that. Well, we're doing call for adoption. We're doing e media types first and then UCCS second. Those are the two. These are working. working those are the working group last well, call. So yeah, exactly. Cool. And these are, cool. these are in a slide deck. And then co -rim. Yes, the specific slide deck because it was a signal. Epoch markers. And uh, the message, um, the media type. So I'm oh, sorry, and the message so wrapper. Epoch marker and the message wrapper are the same thing because these are for, for adoption. So, so I didn't have an adoption yeah. for. But send me While we're waiting, we could use some note takers. We could use a second one. Hedge dog. No, no, no. I usually like to have two. Trust me, you could use the help, especially in this group. Because there, there may be rapid fire comments, you know. But thank you. And your name? AJ. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, but I want to do both in correlation with each. It makes a total sense. That he is relying on so you're, you're they're both in the same deck. The yes, the same and they're also on the same deck. Yeah. But they have separate calls. Separate calls, but at the end of all the presentations, we can break it up. Yeah. It doesn't matter, Ned. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just curious to know how you're going to do it. What, you want, what you want us to do. So the, 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 the decks. In content is in the agenda or not. Okay. So, let's get so welcome to the RATS uh, session today. Uh, just, um, we will, um, we're, we're going to kick it off and get started. So, Nancy, do you want to? Run, gotcha. run the slides. Okay, so <clears throat> just this is the, uh, the note well reminder um, that what the rules are for participating in the IETF. So um, I think uh, everyone has, most everyone has read this. If you haven't read it, please read it and uh, um, uh, be, be aware of, of what the expectations are there in terms of IP. In terms of the IETF code of contact, c conduct, <clears throat> just a brief reminder on some of the key points. Um, uh, we expect that everyone will extend respect and courtesy to their colleagues at all times. Uh, we encourage you to have impersonal discussion. Um, focus on uh, devising solutions for the global internet that meet the needs of diverse technical and operational environments. And uh, we are prepared to contribute to the ongoing work of the group. Next slide. Um, so. The way that we're doing blue sheets is you scan the QR code or you log in using the, uh, you attend using the uh, Meet Echo tool. And there should be a clipboard. So there's a clipboard on the mic. On this, if you can see, I don't know if you can see it, it's wow. behind yeah. Hank's head. Uh, but there's a clipboard there. Um, so please, uh, you know, track your attendance. We also need note takers. We have AJ. Okay, so we can use a second note taker. Someone want to volunteer? Um, thank you. And then, uh, do we need a Zulip watcher? Is there somebody on Zulip? Okay. All right. So if there's someone who is not able to attend, uh, but they're attending through through Zula, uh, if somebody can monitor that and, and then just echo uh, comments and questions for the rest of us, that would be helpful. All right, uh, next slide. It's really slow. All right, so we have um, not a full agenda, but um, um, we do have a few minutes at the end. We'll, we'll see how time goes. We're going to kick it off with uh, Hank, who's going to discuss Eat Media Types. Not yet. We're still agenda bashing. Oh. Let's. So, so basically, we've got a, an agenda where we're covering all of the adopted drafts so far. Um, 
if anybody wants to modify, update, or comment on the agenda, we'll give you one and a half seconds. <laughs> Going once, twice, thrice. All right. All right. Now we're doing the agenda, which is Hank. One and a half seconds. I said one and a half seconds. <clears throat> I need to find your slides. Well, the problem might be just the mic. So everybody else hates me. Hi, I'm Hank. Um, the first two sets of slides, uh, but this, this will be very short presentations, all of them. They will be crisp and they will be uh, comprehensive. And uh, the, first one is about, <laughs> the first one is about IETF Rats um, Eat Media Types. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, lofty slide. Um, I think it makes total sense to, uh, uh, to do the combine this with the bundle, we say, with the EAT uh, process, because the media types are literally, well, for protocols describing EAT media types and surface and, and uh, all that, and, and for something like in TEEP on other uh, protocols that want to transport EAT uh, or EA tokens. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, we closed all of issues. This is a clickable link, so when you have the slides, you can you can see what we're talking about. And the editors, uh, I think someone thought we are authors, um, think this is ready for working group last call. As we uh, got no other feedback, we floated it multiple times. We presented it here and uh, fixed all the little nits that Ayana actually had found already um, in 04. So I think we can't really get better with that than that without a working group last call, and that would be our request. Okay, and the only clarification is by bundling, you don't mean incorporating it into the e-draft. No, 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 but it would be clustered, uh, we assume, in any case. Well, the e-draft has already been shepherded, so. Yeah. So the documents can be shepherded starting at adoption, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this is it. This is my presentation on eat media types, because I think everything else would be redundant. We you spoke about this in length at other meetings. Okay, so with this, we can do a, a working group last call after mm -hmm. this session. Wonderful. So my next presentation is about UCCS. So we let that uh, simmer a lot because um, we think that uh, there are a lot of harmful ways to uh, send unprotected CBOR claim sets over the internet. That is uh, very dangerous. So most of this document is about what to do and what not to do and how to do it. So uh, uh, the normative recommendation here is that uh, this always has to come with a, uh, a prescription and a uh, um, uh, guidance document, so to speak, how to use it. So, uh, so our first use case, obviously, is rats. Uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, extensively peer-reviewed by members from the global platform because they have something similar called, called an unendorsed uh, token. And so, um, so I think, uh, and, and, and Jeremy is one of the co-authors of this idea. So we are in line with uh, hard problems there. Um, all final PRs were approved and pulled. Uh, again, the editors think that this is ready for working group last call. Um, there was one item that was not a, a pushback, but, um, but a note. Uh, we are using secure channel, which typically is uh, the term. Uh, we, that's typically call, uh, assuming it's a, a mutually authenticated secure channel. Um, we describe ways when this is uh, uh, one-sided. So, so we have extensive text about that and how it is done and why it is done. Um, and and Ira, uh, when he, um, this is Ira's comment, uh, when he said that, he was like, you probably will still use that, but uh, add more text than we did that. So um, I think uh, uh, this is also ready for working group last call, we think and would like to ask for an according uh, process. Okay, so um, there's been not a lot of activity on this draft recently. I think that means that it's settled yeah. down. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think it's ready for working group last call. We can mm -hmm. uh, take that to the list. Yeah, and it's also very, very closely related to EAT, obviously. So, um, yeah, that makes sense. So um, when you say you want to bundle it with EAT, does that mean you want to hold off until you want to, 
too. No, no, we, the working group last call can start now. Our assumption is there might be some clustering in the in the queue, and so. Uh, um, oh, hi. So, so, to, so to be clear, you're not asking that we hold off on publication of the eat. No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. That, even now, this goes move far, move fast. I don't want to uh, summon the breath of Lawrence, who's not in the room. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> no, no, no blocking. <laughs> uh, we, are, we are assuming this will go move as so fast that we will arrive at the finish line at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, now I will hand off to my dear colleague Yogesh, who is hopefully um, online. Okay. So I'm standing here as so a replacement. Yogesh, ah, and there, uh, there we go. Okay. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, concise reference integrity manifest uh, um, and uh, I would like to stress that uh, the Corium working group uh, meets pretty regularly on a weekly basis on every uh, Wednesday 7 o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time and if anybody interested uh, from this group is uh, very welcome to attend the meetings and we, we have shared that in the RATS working group so uh, good morning everyone yeah next slide please So the agenda is outlined in the, uh, the amount of work we have done extensively in the last uh, three months between ITF 116 and uh, today's ITF 117. So we we'll talk about the ID progress health um, and uh, what has been added in the introduction sections and various sections and the verifier behavior and the CBOR tax um, pre-allocation stuff as well as uh, life cycles of the various components coming out from the Corim document. So this is the broad agenda of the uh, topic today. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, at, the f at first, I would like to say that um, initially when we started, we didn't have a very clear introduction text of why we need this standard and what is the relevance of Corim. So we have extensively added uh, very clear text in the introduction sections, uh, highlighting the need for um, Corim standard, where I would just summarize quickly in a minute or so. There are multiple supply chain actors who are publishing endorsements at different points in time in different formats. There are different vendors, and each vendor has different product lines. Uh, so the verifier has to kind of see this whole things in a coherent fashion. So this needs a standard, and this is why we have the Corim standard now. And um, that is why we uh, we thought of adding a lot of clear text in the introduction section. And the Corim COMID and COSFID description text have been uh, added in a great detail there. So in addition to that, we have added appraisal workflow. Maybe a better term would be verification workflow, high-level verification workflow of how a Corim based uh, endorsements can be used to follow the verification. And in certain cases, it becomes even more relevant when the evidence coming from the attester is also following the Corim format. So, and in addition to that, we, we explained the, um, in more clarity the need for Corim profiling, why we need profiling in general in Corim, and how one would use it, and what are the constraints, and what are the limitations, and what care one should use one should take when taking using the Corim profiles. And then there are the CBOR tax stuff. Just a last bullet is important. We have been actively working on the draft and we have resolved 10 issues. And we have been actively finding open issues and creating new issues. So there have been 15 new issues created between the last session and this session. Yeah, next slide, please. So, um, we thought of uh, why we need um, this. This slide just highlights why we need a Corim-based ap uh, evidence appraisal procedure in the in the document. Basically, a Corim specification user needs to have a good understanding of how Corim commit associated data can be used in a verification sequence. It needs to uh, the document reader should have a good understanding of that aspect. And, when evidence and endorsement both are in Corium Firmware, even works better. And that helps build a standard high-level flow. And 
kind of gives a guidance for verifier implementers that a standard based verifier like what we are building as a open source project version how it would function and our ultimate goal is to have a one standard based unified verification process and flow so that we don't have fragmented verification flows and fragmented verifications for different types of attestation technologies that's the end goal so we added with this intention in mind we added the evidence appraisal procedure into the document yeah so next slide please so broadly um, the evidence appraisal flow or the logical or algorithm can be broken down into three steps uh, one is the appraisal context initialization then the evidence collection and then the evidence appraisal we will go a bit into detail about these three steps at a high level i don't want to go into too much detail here but we'll spend roughly a minute on each slide so next slide please so as i as i mentioned earlier in the previous uh, slides that there are multiple supply chain actors so when a device life cycle device goes through the life cycle events there could be multiple authoritative entities publishing quorums for uh, a particular vendor and a particular model so uh, potentially in a verifier you could envis you could see multiple quorums in the database and so when the verifier needs to do the appraisal, then it needs to collect all the relevant quorums, extract those quorums, take out the commits, coswits, and cots the, uh, inside the from the quorum, and then based on the cobom, which which tells so one which needs to be activated, it needs to extract the relevant information from these commits and coswits. Even before that, it needs to verify the signature because quorums can be signed. So it is coming from a valid um, source of authority. If they are not, they just can be rejected. So it needs uh, this phase of appraisal context initialization is essentially collection of the relevant quorums and the data inside that, especially commit, COSVID, and COTS, and be ready for the um, next stage of um, uh, our verification flow. So. Uh, next your guess you've got hank on the queue i don't know if you want to take questions uh Have yes hank if I, maybe he wants to add something in there and i'm happy to kind of uh, take the questions here as well yeah hank go ahead please yeah, yeah. the mic is very far away uh, hi this is hank um i'm doing this on slide four um a few slides back the meet echo actually shows slide numbers i never noticed that so um um, we are saying the, where the earmark concept is. Going back to earmark. So I think we, we skipped a little bit over, over earmarking. Um, what we're doing here is that uh, we have like 15 semantically stable um, CBOT tag definitions that we could have uh, early allocation for. But what we're doing here is is to uh, say, well, in the future, we might want to have more in this context. And so we are earmarking uh, a range of CBOT tags from 500 to 599 and say, well, and these should be used for um, CoREM. Uh, we came up with that concept uh, in multiple sessions with Carsten Bormann, who was, uh, uh, had encountered a similar problem and, and, and this was like in a side note here that we are trying this earmark concept and that's experimental, but I wanted to highlight that is maybe something that we want to pick up in, uh, in CBO working group anyway. So there are the fortnightly interims. And um, yeah, I wanted to, to put in some attention to that because uh, I think that has never done before and, uh, and we, we see value in it. So. Sure, thanks Hank. Yes, good catch, yes. Yes, uh, I think we can take questions right now, I suppose. Uh, yeah, Dave Waltermeyer. Uh, thank you. Um, so I noticed um, in Appendix A, there's the complete CDDL um, yep. description. Um, there's quite a bit in there that's copied from the COSWID um, RFC uh, 9393. Um, I think we had to make some updates to that um, as part of the RFC editor process, so it might be out of sync. And 
generally it's probably not a good idea to copy that into this document because if there's ever any kind of errata or update to you know to, to CoSwid, this will you know quickly go out of out of date. So I just wanted to encourage maybe to find a way to you know reference CoSwid instead of embedding it in, in this document. Are you responding? Because uh, yes. Sailor is yeah. on the queue mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I would have just quickly respond okay. to that only. This is Hank. Um, yes. <laughs> At the moment, we are, uh, there are two things that will help us here. Uh, Karsten, uh, also, we have the problem with a lot of CDDL and uh, not only CoSwit. So we have this uh, reference anti pattern ID now that uh, Carson presented at Siwa that is how to do this better, or in core, I think, how to do this better. Um, and we have types. And, and these types, root types, basically, this is the thing we can refer back to and then give the text like, from this type on, it's this other CDDL, you know. And then there is the CDDL2 ish most thing that's the CDL modules for the includes. And uh, we, we assume that Corum will adopt uh, the technique of inclusion and modularization of, of CDDL 2.0 as a first candidate. So we might address exactly that problem with the anti pattern ID and the modularization ID. Okay, that, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Saylor. Uh, Dave Saylor. Um, yeah. This is intended to be an editorial comment, so don't take this as a comment about technology, uh, just to be clear. Um, I like the title of this slide. Um, it is much better than the title of section five, which says current based evidence verification. Uh, the distinction is um, the document uh, can be read as saying this is how you verify corum based evidence as opposed to how you do corum based appraisal of yep. evidence, which is a much better title, right? Because you want evidence to come in as, you know, an SGX report or EAT or corum based or whatever else. And you have corum based appraisal because you have corum based reference sorry, uh, reference values and endorsements and so on. Um, and so I guess my comment would be, if you can change the document to match the slide, that would be great, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a valid point and um, uh, good catch. So we'll change that, not a problem, yeah. You want me to flip back to slide six, Yogesh? Yes, please. Yeah, I think um, we have at length discussed about this slide where how the corims uh, and the information coming inside from the corims have been extracted and collected together and only the relevant information for the appraisal context um, is gathered and uh, we have constructed an appraisal context. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide, please. So this, this step two is more about evidence where the, there is a communication between the attester and the verifier for the collection of evidence. And the first step after the uh, collection of evidence is the verifier um, uh, does the cryptographic validation of the evidence token. We, we, pro we don't promote a specific uh, evidence protocol, but multiple evidence collection protocols can be and should be supported. And once the cryptographic um, um, verification or the cryptographic authenticity of the evidence has been complete, the verifier would then extract the individual claims and represent it in a format which is suitable for the matching. Uh, so basically, we, we call it an accepted claim set where we uh, we lay down, we don't, uh, we don't prescribe a specific format, but we just say that there is a format which is simple for, uh, for matching. So it, it just lay down a few examples in the document where it mentions about DICE and SPDM evidence uh, to be translated into this uh, format of accepted claim set. But uh, this is just a few examples for readers' convenience. So, yeah. And then after we have laid down the evidence, then we go to the step three, uh, which is the next slide, please. So this is uh, this is a work in progress in our document, the evidence appraisal phase, because we have few brainstorming discussions and we are still working on that. But on a broad level, 
once you have the reference values and endorsements from the Corium and Comid, and you have the accepted claim sets um, claims from the evidence, you do the matching procedure. And at that time, you would use the appraisal policy for verification um, into the mix. Uh oh. Sorry. You froze a little bit there, Yogesh, but you're back. Oh, OK. My apologies. I think sometimes the internet can be flaky. So yes, what I'm trying, I was trying to say is that once you have the evidence as an accepted claim sets and you have initialized the context for your uh, data coming from your commit, which are reference values and endorsed values, you would compare the evidence uh, claims with the reference values and utilize the endorsements uh, in your data store or in your verifier to give a much, uh, more, much richer attestation results to the uh, to the relying party. So we are still working on this, and we have few um, few items to flesh out on this aspect. But this is very much a work in progress on step three. So once we have that, we will update it in the document of the future reference. Yeah, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yes, this is an, another important thing which I I would very much uh, focus on the subject is after done with the basic um, evidence and appraisal evidence appraisal uh, what we we are discussing in our weekly meetings is how to model composite attesters because um, composite attesters is, uh, is is a thing and you would see in various discussion that it is not just um, uh, a particular piece of attester uh, which is generating the evidence but it is uh, evidence could be a composition or a composite attester say for example attestation produced by gpu in a device and a cpu in a device and how the composite attester would look like and how the endorsements associated to the composite attester would look like so we have a couple of options we have been debating in the meetings how the endorsements for the composite attester would would look like and what would be their information and data format and another important topic we have been discussing in our weekly meetings is modeling the life cycle when when this specific firmware components or whatever is your reference values they change over time the firmware gets updated how would we model that how would we model when certain when a security vulnerability is detected in a software component you want to remove that from or you want to mark that unusable i won't say remove but you want to mark them unusable so that it remains there for tracking purpose for auditability but you don't use it when or you would mark if you would fail an attestation if a token at evidence comes from an attester which which has that particular software company so those kind of things we are extensively discussing in the coming meetings yes i think hank wants to add something in here so hank yep. please go ahead we have about three minutes on this okay so you, you yep. need to wrap up two yes i think i have wrapped up but yes. <laughs> hank you are there i can't hear you yes i think it is the last slide hi so this is hank again um you think you said something quite uh, uh critical here uh, that we do not uh, remove um, not applicable quorums, but uh, highlight them as such uh, for later purposes, like legacy devices that still run that, and you can be aware of that, and, and, and you know the danger around that. And uh, that is uh, maybe a connection to the uh, Skid Working Group uh, hackathon output, where we uh, started to uh, use the NVD and content uh, and structure that semantically in a, in a Skid transparency service, uh, Corem is actually the next candidate here. Um, but we have to get some of those wrinkles out before we can be actual payload for that use case. But uh, yeah, I think those Corems might never go away. It's very important for auditing that you kind of stopped something 10 years ago to update, still using it, and can see what consequences this is today, uh, has today. And I think uh, that's, a, that's an excellent, another use case. And uh, we are thinking a little bit also on that direction that we never really met, make them go away, but uh, therefore continuous auditing for a longer span of time after the fact, uh, let them exist, stay existing. 
yeah thank you hank uh, thanks and i would say i'm happy to uh, answer any questions offline because i have run out of time but feel free to reach out to corim working group and ask any questions via email itf rats working group or any email thread is fine with us thank you thanks to gash next up epic markers Hi, this is Hank again. Um, also, these slides, although about um, being in the middle of the process of uh, becoming working group items, will be uh, concise, crisp, and um, small. So, epoch markers we have been talking about a little bit before we go to the net. Before we go to the next slide, it's a little bit about uh, uh, being a clock. So, we uh, ring the epoch bell, and in a certain domain, a new age of freshness is then called in. And <laughs> that is done via epoch markers. <laughs> it's a little bit poetic, I'm sorry. So next slide, please. So you have multiple payloads for that. And so uh, since uh, Yokohama had a, uh, a very extensive uh, review, uh, sorry, yeah, review um, input from Carl Wallace that um, Thomas addressed formidably the items that I was assigned to, <laughs> not so much. And uh, so we dropped uh, the one thing that was not in a cozy sign one uh, envelope easily. It was a self-signed um, structure, so to speak. So the contents of the structure include signed nodes. So the whole thing didn't that didn't have to be wrapped in a cozy envelope because uh, the structure itself included the proofs that would show uh, um, that and uh, authentic. Um, so that was the odd one out, as uh, Thomas would like to say, and uh, we dropped that for now. So to make the uh, message layer more uniform and create more uh, simple and readable text about that. So that has been done. So open items, uh, basically all on me. Um, we're waiting still on a reference to concise evidence um, because like, well, the question, <laughs> what's that? Um, so concise evidence is a TCG thing for SPDM binding, for the protocol binding, and it's basically uh, evidence that looks, that looks like Corum. Um, they were looking like at Corem and were like, why should we put effort in evidence creation when you basically defined the evidence format for us? We just add 20 lines of CDDL and now it becomes evidence. So the matching for the verifier is like super simple now because it's symmetric format and that's concise evidence and there will be a document and I actually thought that would be there before the submission are cut off, but it wasn't. And it, it isn't today. So my optimism was a little bit hmm, thwarted. There will be a good reference for that and we will, will see that 20 lines of CDDL can transmogrify a CORAM into concise evidence. Um, Carl highlighted that... Uh, Nonces are not nonces in our document, and that is absolutely right. If you if you go with the translation, I think that's a common one. Number uh, used only once. Um, when you send out a nonce to several entities, that each of them only use them once, time one time, you're still not using a nonce actually anymore. So we were like, it's the same procedure and the same semantics somehow, but a lot of people are using the same nonce now once. And uh, we might need a better name for that, or we might need a, a better explanation. Um, so what we definitely need is, and that was Carl's uh, call of the comment, um, <coughs> some uh, nonce handling considerations for unsolicited and solicited nonce distribution, uh, which means uh, I have a subscription state to the epoch bell, and I'm expecting, therefore, regular brings from epoch markers, and, and or I just get it sent uh, unsolicited, like with unidirectional remote attestation, suddenly epoch, and I was not really aware that this is a thing now. So, and non-sending might be different in those cases. And, uh, and we were like, okay, that's true, but that's not only, not only true for uh, epoch markers, that's true for everything in that interaction model. So we decided and asked um, for uh, the route to add these uh, non-handling considerations, sorry, that's a working work with project's title, into the reference interaction model ID, actually. Um, so uh, that was simmering a little bit. We, I think we had uh, one other thing on DAA for that, and now we have a second thing for it to, to elaborate on non-handling. Uh, so that's up, that's an open issue. And then, uh, yeah, naming is hard. As I said, maybe it's not a non help us or we just write more text around it like, and, and explain why this is almost like a nonsense. Um, it's called a handle in the reference interaction model. 
Um, I'm not entirely sure if that's also a good name. Uh, so this is a working group question, and that's why we would like to ask for uh, adoption now, because I think all the problems are laid out, and I think only the interesting part that the working group can solve are there now. So I have a question before we go into that. Um, so in the COS working group, you presented on IPUP markers and COS signature block. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you say more about what the expectations that this draft has on how epoch markers are are to influence signaturing formats? Is the, is it this the sense that the epoch markers re rely on some other signature format for for its utility, or uh, can they be into um, separately signed? And are uh, does this the draft define what signature types are being used? Um, the draft will recommend a go to, so a fallback. I don't want to call it mandatory to implement because I don't, don't think it's true. Uh, it fall, will fall back to a cozy sign one as a recommendation. And, and, and then we go into the dark pit room that is the cozy profiling problem. And, and yeah, we might do a type or a cozy profile for that. So but what I'm getting at is, is there a clear separation of duties between what this working group would work on in this draft and what Co's working group would work on? Not yet. I think the demarcation line is foggy. Um, I would not deliver this document without a um, usable and implementable guidance how to sign it in Cozy because the structure itself is in CBOR. So um, um, that doesn't mean that this is the right answer. This is my answer. <laughs> Okay, do you have adoption of this in COSI? No, we do not. We, we are, this is Red's document. We will, we will decide it here, and then we can go with whatever. But there's components that go both ways where you need decided in both working groups. So Yeah, what we are doing in, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we did COSI with in, in SACM and did the signing thing for it in SACM and also did also not go to COSI. That's an option. Um, yes, so, that, but, was, that was my point. I didn't yeah. know if you had already proposed within COSI some of this work. No, 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 no. I was um, talking about it, but I was not, not talking about doing it there. No. Okay. Well, as long as we have the cross review when the time comes. Yeah, so that, that, that would happens. be nice. I think so. So, Dave, there, I hadn't thought about this until the chairs raised the question here. Uh, but I just checked the document, and 90% of the document is actually not about rats. And so the real question is, should this actually be a COSE document and we reference it and use it in, in, in RATS, or should it be a RATS document? And I don't know the answer for that, but when I look at the document, 90% of it is actually not RATS specific. I, I get that. Um, the one RATS specific thing is the non-handling, because that's an interaction model ID that is for evidence of conveyance that is in RATS. And the other funny thing is, this is about freshness, and nobody gets this. The expert for freshness are here. And uh, that's why we're also here. <laughs> So the chairs uh, were sort of implicitly asking, should this actually go into COSE with RETS review? And offhand, I'm leaning towards saying, that sounds like a good idea to me, chairs. Yeah, I mean, to me, it sounds like it should be raised in COSE as well. I mean, we, we, can, we, can, we can do that again. Um, again, I have a strong uh, preference of doing it where the experts are. And, and doing COSE sign one with a small profile is, is a, is a, is a no-brainer, I think. Um, if, we, if, we, if we realize we want to more, have more complex, cozy interaction, I think that's fine. But I still think that the real important part here is the uh, ringing, uh, ringing in new ages of freshness and understand what the difference of freshness and recentness is in this context. That's just my opinion. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is common, but if this is only covering 10%, let's get uh, the advice that you'd like from this room factored sure. into the hopefully cozy document. So okay, think, that's very I opinionated, but uh, I can, uh, we can, we can do it in the next interim. That's, that's, that's for sure. A cozy interim, I mean. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Moving on to message rep. Yeah. So conceptual message rappers are basically self-explaining. We have conceptual messages and <laughs> Rats, and uh, this is a uh, uniform, uniforming wrapper for them. Uh, next slide, please. Why is this a title slide? Because this is the title slide. OK, there are two title slides. You, next slide, please. I'm flipping <laughs> your slide. Yeah, I know. There, apparently, there was a place for the slide. So, 
So yeah, it's an encapsulation for conceptual messages as defined by the REDS architecture. So especially for as an example here for the background check model, it allows a record, uh, relying party to be agnostic about the actual format of the evidence if that's bundled with it. So exchange between the test and verifier becomes easier. Relying parties are basically, uh, if they relay it, they don't care. There's, there's not, you know, the, the, the evidence, if you remember, the evidence is relayed by the relying party. And it can be used in other places like a tested TLS, uh, the TCG DICE architecture and on the TCG DICE uh, endorsement architecture, and probably a lot of other attestation key formats, uh, uh, key attestation formats. So, um, so things that we, we, we talked about this in Yokohama already. Um, also, there was an in-depth review by Carl, again, two thumbs up. You're very involved in this, and this, this was really, really helpful. Uh, it basically resulted in uh, uh, quite a lot of changes in the document, and we uh, uh, based after having incorporated those review um, comments, um, uh, did a proof of concept uh, implementation for ATLS uh, and remote, uh, corresponding remote attestation TLS framework. And so, uh, yeah, we have actually running code for this and, uh, and this is pretty stable at the moment. So uh, now it has to be bashed and pulled apart by working group discussion, I think. Um, that's why we also uh, would like to request CFA here. So I'd like to get a, a read from the room who's read this and any, any, any version of it besides Carl. Besides Carl? Yeah, because Carl's probably right. yeah. I don't see Carl. Yugesh. Oh, that's bad. Yugesh, Yugesh. Yugesh can you ah. you're in the queue? Yeah, I have read it and I'm using it actually heavily. So <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted to say. As part of Verizon? As, for, as part of uh, attested TLS work, uh, which we will cover in uh, a okay. few minutes. Yeah. Anybody else in the room or in the meeting? Yeah. Okay. So I can, what I can say is thinking on bylaws is that the Trusted Computing Group likes conveying evidence over relying parties. <laughs> I think but this I can say. <laughs> so I think we'll take to the, okay, Roman. Hi, I was wondering, could we get some commitment maybe in the room to review mm -hmm. it in addition to taking the mailing yeah. list? Okay. All right. Anyone? Lawrence. Can we get at least one or two more? Bueller, anyone? <laughs> I know it's anyway. a very obvious thing to do, and so it's very mechanical, but uh, maybe someone should read it. Just, yeah, we just need more than Anyone? a few people. Someone looking for another screen sheet? Just get engaged? Sessions. Okay, Jake. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Anyone else looking for opportunities to get engaged? Get involved? Okay, so we've got AJ and Lawrence. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and thank you. I think that's the last slide. And um, as promised, these were for once crisp and concise. Thanks, Hank. Okay. Yes, you are. Yeah, I am not this Okay. All right. So I'm gonna talk about the endorsements document that's now on draft 02, next slide. Okay, um, my intent is not to represent this one, but to remind you, this is the slide that everybody liked in this diagram last time. We're talking about the document that talks about this diagram. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, you can go and watch the recording from last time or read the draft. But this is to refresh your memory. Um, the thing that people really liked last time in the working group, they said, gosh, it sure is good to have a document that explains this and says endorsements fill in the gap in the bottom left there. Um, again, I don't want to repeat it unless you have questions because we, have, we presented that in the 15 minutes or so of last IATF meeting. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this is what was in draft 00 that we presented last time. And so I'm going to talk about the differences. So next slide. So last time, there was a bunch of people that said in the working group, yes, we should have a document on this. Uh, and oh, can you talk about this too? And so Thomas Vasati was one of those. Thank you, Thomas. 
And so one of the issues that he raised had to do with conditionally endorsed values, and this is discussed in some other documents that he pointed me to. Um, and so the idea here is that, uh, so just to talk about endorsements in general, some claims and endorsements might be conditional, like this particular value applies only if the evidence says that the following thing is true, right? So if the version of the software is greater than five, then it means that the security property is X, okay? And so uh, that concept was not previously in the document and it's now used in other places. And so it's good to have that text in there. So I authored some text and Thomas Ackbit. And so it's now in draft 02. Um, there's also guidance that says you should not be using, there's no point in using conditionally endorsed values for things that are immutable, like a hardware serial number or anything else that's burned in your hardware, right? You'd either endorse it or not endorse it, right? There's no reason to have a conditional thing and make the verifier spend cycles checking, right? Um, and then there was a question I first asked and then answered my question and Thomas said, yes, I agree with your answer. And I think Ned said the same thing. And anybody else that reviewed it so far said, yes, I agree with your answer. Uh, and the question was, um, when doing these conditions, then you have some notion of matching, right? It says, okay, if this value is greater than this one or is equal to that one, and so you got this matching against some value, okay? And that's kind of what appraisal policy does, where you're doing that matching against reference values, right? So the question is, what's the relationship between conditionally endorsed values in the endorsement and the reference values that the verifier uses? Because they're not the same thing, right? And we said, well, we better explain what the difference is because it'll become a frequently asked question if we don't, okay? And so here, as we said, there's two differences, okay? One is that anything that's in the conditionally endorsed values in the endorsement is not about trustworthiness, which is a judgment call by the verifier or a judgment call by the relying party is delegated to the verifier, right? It's about whether the endorser says the following things are true if and only if. And so here, the thing that's in control of the reference, the, the comparison of the expected values, right? You can see matches some expected values. I needed a term other than reference values, and I get to this later on because the document in draft 02 confuses them as is pointed out in, by uh, Muhammad in the last slide. Um, and so here I'm using expected values just to give a terminology dis uh, distinction. Um, and so here the con or endorser is in control of that that says, I'm endorsing it as long as the following values are true, right? as opposed to the, the verifier that says, I'm going to say it's trustworthy if the following things are true. It's a different statement, a different phrasing. Even though some of the matching things like you know, equals or greater than or equals or so on might be the same or similar, the, 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 the sort of operators, right? Um, and then there's just a note that says, okay, if this notion of saying, okay, how do I encode a greater than operation or greater than or equal to operation or a set membership operation, if, that, if your endorsements is in a different format coming into the verifier than the appraisal policy, then it just means, yeah, you gotta have two parsers that say greater than or equal to means this thing in this format and greater than or equal to means this thing in this format. That's how it's just encoded. Just a statement about encoding of verifiers or implementations of verifiers. Okay, so that's basically what the text says. And so far the filers have been happy with that, but it's different from last time and we didn't talk about it other than Thomas raising it at the mic, so. Yeah. All right. Next slide. So that was the first of the three issues. Second one, also, uh, also originally raised by Thomas Vasadi, but as we'll see, also raised by uh, Muhammad. Um, the notion that there exist some claims that have to do with identity, right? And so if you looked at the uh, CoRM document that, was, that Yogesh was presenting, right, where it talked about the different steps and so on, right, it's very common in verifier implementations to say, I'm going to do two passes, right? My first pa steps, I should say. The first step is to cryptographically check to see whether the evidence comes from something I should bother spending CPU on, okay? And if that passes, then sure, I'll take the accepted claims and run the appraisal policy and compare them against reference values and so on. So if you break it into those two steps, that means some things that come in the evidence would be, or you know, some things that come in in the endorsement, I should say, are, are about, um, uh, identity related claims for some definition of identity, right? Many different definitions. The point is things that you'd apply to that first pass step that says, is it worth doing the other stuff, okay? And so whether it's verification keys or whatever else, it's part of that cryptographic check that says, do I trust the thing enough to see whether it's trust, to, to see if it's okay in the current state, okay? And so you don't have to do those two passes, but if you do, then it fits into this category of identity related claims. 
And since there was at least two people that were asking for it, we had a text in there that says, okay, you can have this. Now, syntactically, it might be encoded because this is not a document about encoding. It's an up-level thing, but syntactically, it, can be, it could be treated just like any other claim. Or you could treat it maybe separately semantic and say, well, there's the identity batch of stuff and there's the non-identity batch of stuff. And you do these claims in step one and these claims in step two. So some implementations might treat them differently. And we know like Verizon does treat them differently in that way. And so the generalization of endorsing identity is just to say appraisal policy for evidence might have multiple steps. Okay? So identity is the most obvious example of we might have step one and step two. But you can imagine a more complicated one that just says you could define this of having three steps or something, you know, whatever it is, you know, freshness check, uh, you know, you could do your uh, identity check, then a freshness check, and then the rest of the appraisal, right, whatever it is, right. And so the endorsements might have, you know, uh, the appraisal policy for evidence might have multiple steps. And so the endorsement just has to be aware of that if you need to provide endorsed information that would be necessary in that step. Okay. So again, this whole document is intended to be informational just like the architecture document was, right? There's nothing about encoding. There's nothing that's actually you'd implement. It's all about uh, people writing the other documents to be able to refer to this, right? So my hope is that, for example, um, CoRIM, which does talk about the encoding for an endorsement format, could informatively reference this document, right? Assuming it gets adopted by the working group. Okay, next slide. Okay, so those are the two that actually uh, first got filed and, and were addressed before uh, Draft 02 appeared. The last one is one that I filed myself. And this is also another topic that was not discussed in the architecture document. So I want to take a couple minutes on this one. So this is actually the one I'll spend the most time on is this one slide here. Okay. And I think we have time, but let me know if I need to speed up. Okay. Nope, you have another nine minutes. Okay, great. I'm going to probably spend uh, several of them on this one slide alone. Okay. All right. So on the right side, we have things that go in evidence. And so your evidence can have a number of different claim sets. In this example, those claim sets are for different components at different layers. So for example, think of a dice chain, right? Where you have a claim set for your hardware, claim set for your firmware, claim set for your maybe OS, a claim set for maybe the application that's actually you're talking to, some set of things in your evidence that's at different layers. And this is an example where they're strictly stacked because that was the example that I used in the other slide everybody liked, okay? So I took this part on the right and it kind of matches the other slide that everybody liked, okay? And so in the past, we've normally talked about endorsements as being the bottom left, right? The endorsement comes from a hardware manufacturer and it comes and says, well, if the following thing is true, then here's some additional claims and values, whether they're conditional or unconditional that apply to my hardware, right? So, you know, if it's uh, Intel, then Intel would say, ah, this thing is good because it has a serial number and here's some other properties that apply to that model and so on, okay? Or if it's, uh, you know, NXP with an ARM chip, then it'd say, okay, well, this thing has trust zone. If it says this is this model, then here's some additional properties about trust zone that you can use. Okay. Now, the difference is here that each different component here on the right could come from completely different manufacturers or vendors, right? You could have whoever makes your hardware, whoever you got the firmware from, let's say you're running you know, Windows or a particular Linux distro, and then an app claim set, and those could all be from different vendors. Okay, so this concept that says, whoever the manufacturer or vendor is of a particular component, okay, says, I have some additional properties about that thing that I'm going to vouch for. Okay, and if you trust me, the provider of that piece of software or hardware, then here's some additional properties that could be add-ins based on conditions being true. Okay, so you might say, as the OS claim set, well, if the OS version number is greater than or equal to five for, say, you know, Linux kernel, then here's some additional properties that I, as the distro, would want to vouch for about that. Right? I've said that there are no CVEs or it's passed this compliance test or whatever. So I could put those in there. And so this is showing an example where you can have endorsements about multiple components that come from different sources. Okay, exactly. But it's never been discussed any place. And so this is a diagram that points that out. Okay, and so that's why I wanted to uh, capture this. Now, what does come into this is a security consideration that is not yet in the document, but if you're a security person, you're a student, you should be jumping up and down right now because the main point to make that's absent from the document that needs to go in 03 is that it's not okay for say the hardware endorser to provide additional claims about the OS or vice versa, right? How do you tie the actual uh, vendor to say, who do I trust? I wanna trust this endorser for this component and not other ones, okay? That's a concept that needs to be in the document. It's not in 02, that will be in 03, okay? 
And so I want people to think about that because I actually haven't seen a real discussion about that, but it's super important. It says, when I want to say as a verifier, here's my set of trusted endorsers. In this example, I have more than one. I trust them for different purposes, just like you say the, the analogy would be EKU, right? EKU, you trust a particular certificate for a particular purpose, and that's the same analogy here. Okay. Kathleen Moriarty. So this, including the diagram, is the exact same concept I had in the attestation sets document, and the only difference would be that I was tying the sets of what you'd be attesting to known standards, right? Similar to what was done in the reference integrity measurements where they got more specific so that you had a set of things you were consistently between vendors asserting. And part of that is because in disclosure, I work for Center for Internet Security and a nonprofit, and we work with consensus experts to produce such documents. And so it made sense to me a while back mm -hmm. that this would be needed, and it would be a very nice way to concisely bundle at different layers each of these pieces. The other part of that is some of them could be too large once we get further along into the process. Like right now, we might only be doing something like a signature over a container, and claiming that all of the things that you'd expect to see are already done in that operating system and you're signing it once, so you could just issue that container and it, it looks good. But over time, it's going to grow, right? As we get better at this, same as what happened with the firmware boot, boot process, and that it took time to get it right because you crash things otherwise. Um, so yes, I obviously am very interested in this concept as I have a similar, very similar draft. And the only the only difference is I took the NIST 800-193 diagram to show these exact same layers. Okay. Thank you for the pointer. Um, we'll see if we can add some references. Uh, Co-authors gratefully accepted. <laughs> yeah, I see two yeah, other people. We're, we're, we're yeah. Yeah, 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 two other people in queue, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> keep my camera straight. Yeah, so hi, this is Hank. Um, yeah, so what we call these uh, boxes on the left side that are layer specific, uh, these are uh, environments in Corum, and we uh, have to identify them. So we have uh, three types of identifiers for them. It's class, instance, and group. Um, a class, for example, could have uh, something like vendor model layer and or index for from whatever Yang module. And and so yeah, we are obviously have to associate them with some certain environment, especially in composite or layered attestation. And uh, so I think what you are doing here is basically on an abstract level describing what's in section three in CoRAM. Uh, section three, actually it's three, one, four, one, one. Uh, nesting is bad, I know. Um, but yeah, we have that concept, basically. It's, it's essential to every um, uh, composite device uh, remote attestation. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. Hopefully the note taker captured that reference or I'll find it in the transcript. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Three, one, four, one, okay, one. <laughs> um, who's up, Andrew? Andrew, you're in the queue. All right, okay. Um, yeah, so I think Hank has, has taken a certain amount of my point, um, which was to say that this is a good slide to have. Um, and we had been thinking about it in the, the, the CoRIM team. And I think that solving this is one of the difficult problems that um, that Yugesh was mentioning in his slides, and, and, and that's getting to the top of our queue, and, um, and, and contributions will be welcome. Thank you. Yeah, um, my my comment is really about identity and attestation keys that I, I fear that are getting glossed over in this discussion. Um, I can sit down if you if you give me some time to talk later, okay. or I can yep. go now. Uh, I guess that's up to the chairs on time management. <laughs> uh, can you repeat? Sorry, sorry. I'm doing a time check, which we uh, have plenty. Okay, uh, I want to make sure I have time to talk about attestation keys and identity. I don't think that's in your, you, you glossed okay. over it. We, we, have a, <clears throat> we have open mic time. We yeah. can extend no, part this part of session. This it's part of yeah. this draft. It, 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 yeah. It's actually on the slide before where I said a testing identity. That's probably the most yeah. relevant one. Yeah. yeah. So he's saying, and can we go a, back to that and can you spend five minutes on it? It's yeah. a pretty important issue for me. Do uh, you want to talk about this slide now? No, I, the, slide yeah, that one. End. Yeah, okay. I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk about whatever your schedule is here, but. 
I'm just trying to get clarification from an yeah. agenda standpoint. We have plenty of time. Okay. Right. It's the question of whether we do it yeah. after yeah. Yogesh talks about attend the TLS uh, one. I think let's do it now while it is. Okay. Sense. We have context. We have yeah. context. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I would say the endorsing identity section is uh, fairly terse. Co-author is welcome. If you have a bunch to say, uh, you know, welcome text contributions and so on. So go ahead. Okay. okay. So I'm going to I'm going to speak on this now. Um, so uh, this isn't like an architecture draft. So it's going to inform uh, how endorsements are done. All sorts of forms of endorsement from stuff that's already existing in hardware and that you buy off the shelf to some future hardware people are gonna build and software and all sorts of things. So it needs to be very general, yep. right? So that means it needs to uh, deal with key material because one of the most important parts of an endorsement is the key material to verify the evidence. So I, mean, I would expect a section that's like three pages long that says key material for verifying uh, evidence in this draft. I would expect it, and I would expect it not to be named identity because some places use the term identity, some places don't. I mean, that's just, at least I don't, I mean, to me that term is ambiguous. It doesn't, key material is not synonymous or it doesn't cue me into to the idea of key material. So let me give you an example of a project, an attestation project that I worked on and that involved two Fortune 500 companies represented in this room that involved creating millions of keys, a database of millions of keys and shipping them from one, from the hardware vendor to the software vendor. That was the way the attestation keys were transferred. These were, uh, these were basically seeds that were used to generate EC keys. Uh, so they were secrets. Um, no, actually they weren't. They were secret on the manufacturer side and, and public on the other side. So um, that's a use case, a very real use case that was built that has to be allowed for in this document. And I don't think the word identity, like we never used the word identity when we, when we did that. Uh, uh, I don't think the word identity captures that at all. You know, so attestation keys can be public keys, they can be symmetric keys, they can be uh, key material for uh, some sort of a, a DAA protocol. I mean, these protocols, I mean, they, they are, there are probably DAA protocols yet to be ident uh, invented it needs to accommodate all of that stuff. And to me, uh, I would oppose adoption of the draft unless you address all this, uh, at least ha have some text on this in this uh, draft to um, you know, frame that up and say that that is part of an endorsement. Okay, so I got two questions for you. Yeah. Um, number one, if the working group agrees that it should be in here and it just hasn't been written yet, would you oppose adoption? No, no, no. Okay, that's, 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 is, that's, that was, that's what I want to hear. I understand. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I, I agree in principle that that would make sense as far okay, as how, okay. the length that's, of it or whatever. You seem to have in your head that the magic number is three pages. That tells me you think oh, you know what it would not. say. And so my question is, um, no, no, do you have no. any volunteers to contribute such text? <laughs> okay, I Are see, you I volunteering? See, I, I see two other hands. So. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, so, you're so, in the queue. That's why uh, I'm asking. Uh, yeah, so, so the main thing I wanted to hear was that that this is, you're open to all of this in the draft. I, I am personally open to it, yeah, absolutely. Okay. In fact, that, the, the term identity came in because both of the people yeah, that yeah, actually okay. filed this issue separately, both use the term identity claims yeah, or endorsing yeah. identity, right? Yeah, and so that's yeah. where the title came from because I knew both people that filed yeah, it would yeah, be happy yeah, with yeah, that, right? I, yeah, okay. If you want to generalize it, that's fine with me. Yeah, as long as there's openness to work my, on My this, goal that's... is to have a document, right, that, that actually talks about endorsements, right, which the yeah, architecture yeah. document was very vague on and there's okay. been lots of questions, so. Okay, uh, I'm good, thank you, Dave. I, I want to do whatever the working group wants to do, so. And, and, and I'm happy to accept co-authors, I'm saying, okay. Um, okay, so now let's go back on. Thank you for letting us have the five minutes there. So, well, Hank's in the queue. Oh, Hank's in the queue. All right, guess, sorry. Yeah, you go got ahead. two people in the queue. So, finally, uh, we are also danced around the term identity. We are all, all, only, only always identifying environments that are somehow related in an attester. Identity, we only use in the one place where it's safe to use them, it's, it's a device identity because there are secure device identifiers, and, and we can safely back on that rock if um, someone attacks that we can say there, there's that we can do that right so but everything else and then, and then the attester is hard to identify and of course key material can be used to identify things and that's absolutely fine but we're calling uh, we are never calling it that and then that is right but that's why it might have to contribute to your section yeah. that you need yeah okay your gosh is on the queue 
Hi. Um, Dev, I just have one question for you. I think maybe you might have answered that in the previous session. So just a quick one. Uh, what do you see um, a need for this uh, draft? Um, if if you can, if you possibly you can collaborate with us on Corim and uh, make that draft better rather than having a separate draft. Um, there's a distinction. In, so let me give you the, the the analogy that the architecture document itself is informational and allows multiple bindings for different things like multiple evidence formats and so on. So for example, if you were to look at EAT and say, well, this makes sense to put in the EAT document. No, the EAT document is a proposed standard and it's a particular encoding. And the architecture document is kind of an overview across documents. It says, okay, here's some documents about evidence. Here's some documents about reference values and endorsements. Here's some documents. And so it's the informational place as opposed to the thing that you actually implement. And so that division, the working group is done in other, work, in other documents. And so that's what I see as why not to put it in CORIM per se is to, because CORIM would be a proposed standard document, not an informational one. And the, the same division we did in other documents, and so that's why it's a different document right now, is because logically, the document we would have put it in, okay, is if we were doing this, you know, three years ago, we would have put it into the architecture document. So think of it as an extension to the architecture document that's decoupled because it's about a, a, a different a related the, topic. The chairs agree with you, Dave. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. So good question. Thank you for asking. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, I think I have one more slide. So let's go to the one after the diagram, which is the one about Muhammad's uh, issue. Okay, all right, so uh, just after, I think it was just after, I don't know, it was either just after or just before, but I didn't get to it uh, before filing O2. And so there's one outstanding issue besides the one I mentioned that has yet to be filed that I presented. It's the security considerations around the, in, the, around the multiple endorsements and stuff. Uh, so this one was filed. So Muhammad filed this one, and it has a bunch of bullets in there that I can split into three categories. At least that's how I interpret it. The first one is technical comments, okay? And I put that into categories of wanting discussion of endorsing identity and uh, something that I believe is addressed or, addr or should be addressed by any future versions, if it's not right now, of the conditionally endorsed values section. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about the technical ones because I believe that everything can be bucketed into w one of the previous slides. Okay, um, And I'm sure Mohammed will correct me if that's not the case, but right now if we actually talk through it, my guess is the second one, the way to solve it is conditionally endorsed values. Just to tell you what he's talking about, it was about the text that says in the architecture document, actual state is in uh, the combination of like evidence and endorsements. And he says, well, you know, endorsements and an actual state may come at different time, may come at different times or whatever. So how does that work? Uh, and good text around conditionally endorsed values could say, well, I'm conditionally endorsing. These are the current values that I'm endorsing if and only if the current values are whatever, right? So there may be a better discussion of that uh, given that this came in afterwards. But that's why the conditionally endorsed values is really what he's talking about there. Then there's some editorial ones, like he uh, pointed out that there's lowercase reference, reference values, there's a typo, and uppercase reference values. Now, they're the same, or are they different? Okay. Well, the actual answer is uppercase reference values mean what the ARC doc says. Lowercase reference values was, uh, in some cases, the same typo, and in other cases, it meant what I called expected values of the ones, right? The things you're doing in the conditionally endorsed values. So I had to go through and clean that up, and that is in progress. It's not, up, it's not checked in yet, and so I got to clean that up. And some other editorial things, like what does this mean, okay? And then he had uh, a question, uh, some questions to say, just make sure you that this is right. Um, for SGX, okay? How would this apply in the SGX example? And talked about you know, MR Enclave and so on. It says, what is the exact mapping of this? And, and well, one answer is, well, any of the answers should be on the list, not in the document, right? Because this isn't the binding document. This is the high level thing. And the goal is just to make sure that there's no statement that is like incorrect when you take SGX into account, right? But it's still worthwhile answering these questions on the list, right? If there's people that are SGX experts that can comment on, well, here's what it means here. And so, um, one example had to do with, um, uh, well, I don't remember, I was talking to Ned about it yesterday. Um, uh, anyway, um, so I guess I'll go on. You can read it on the, on, the, uh, on the list or in the GitHub or whatever. So I don't know if Muhammad is online, but that's my belief is that um, there's editorial work to be done. Uh, there's some technical clarifications to be done based on the discussion right here. Um, but my personal opinion is that... Um, those are the work of the working group doing work. And so I 
uh, as an author, I think that could be done after adoption if we agree on the principles, but that's up to the next slide. I think the last slide is to say, um, uh, it, could this be done in the working group rather than being as an individual submitter? Thank you, Ron, thank you. So this is Hank. Um, that might be an obvious answer to you, but the uh, Confidential Computing Consortium has an attestation SIG that is directly dealing with such questions. So bringing that yep. question there also might help. Yeah. Uh, and the SGX binding, correct? Yeah. Uh, Hank's advertising that Hank and I and a couple others actually participate in meetings on a biweekly basis, meaning every two weeks. Uh, just advertising, it's on uh, Tuesday mornings. If you're interested, um, we can you know post a link to the list. They're public meetings, so. Okay, so I think it's the next steps, Dave. Um, there's enough commonality with the claim sets that Kathleen had provided in the previous draft. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be good to see that convergence. And then Lawrence had provided some concerns with identities and keys. So I think our recommendation is for you to update the draft, add the co-authors. I think Hank and Lawrence, you had volunteered to provide some of the identity and keying. Um, so if you can tell me who's willing to be a co-author, I'm happy to like start a separate thread. Kathleen? Well, so, yes. Yeah, so yeah. I came up with okay. this idea yes, ago. yes. L Lawrence, was that a volunteer or volunteering somebody else? I mean, I'm less worried about the co-authorship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, right? what I'm worried about is, is starting an email thread among, because you want us to update the document with pulling in some other stuff. I want right. to start uh, like roping people into a discussion, right? right? No, so I don't want to I miss somebody three, that wants to contribute. I have three. So for sure, okay. you have the authors okay. from the claim set draft. Okay. That's Kathleen. And, okay. and okay. then Hank and Lawrence can contribute. Yeah. And then I leave it to them on authorship. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Does that give you direction? I think yeah. so. Yeah. All right. Thanks. That's it. Thanks. Okay. So if there are others besides the ones I listed, I think, Tom, you might have just reached out to Dave. Yeah, you had offered as well, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's the last one, right? Yogesh? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I've Hi. got, I think, your slides. Yes, thank you. So hello, good morning again, everyone. So today I, on this session, I'm going to talk about uh, how we have used attestation as a, mecha as a first class um, credential for authentication in the TLS uh, handshake. So um, this is the title of uh, my presentation. If you can go to the next slide, please. So this style just um, basically we have been using um, the, uh, PKI for uh, traditional authentication on the TLS protocol. And what we are proposing here is to introduce um, um, remote attestation, which means um, uh, verifying the hardware features for um, and and attesting the security state of the device uh, as part of the TLS handshake, and um, we we are standardizing this uh, attestation work uh, as an authentication mechanism in TLS, and to to validate our cons proof of uh, to validate what we are proposing in the standards, um, we have an open source working proof of concept now and in that that activity is part of the ccc sic the Con confidential consortium uh, sic special interest group yeah next slide please so this this slide just highlights uh, broadly what kind of uh, changes uh, we have done uh, so we have as part of tls extensions we have defined the new certificate type where we introduce the attestation metadata, the evidence uh, which is coming from the uh, device, which is a combined evidence, which we'll talk about in the subsequent slide, which is sitting next to the, it can sit next to the X.509 or acts as an independent certificate. 
and the attestation metadata is completely opaque to the transport layer uh, protocol and the tls extensions uh, we are defining new tls extension which uh, adds um, as part of tls handshakes the capabilities for uh, what the attesters and what the relying parties can do they exchange those capabilities for attestation so as to agree on a certain set of um, media types and stuff and then can undergo the attestation um, exchange so that um, the attestation can be undertaken as part of the tls handshake and the last point i want to highlight it it is a mutual uh, attestation which, which means client can verify the server as well as the server can verify the client based on the attestation credentials that that protocol supports authenticating both sides yeah next slide please you've got lawrence on the queue oh, okay sure do you mean attesting both client and server or authenticating both client and server or both I mean, both I, actually I, doesn't the, the tls does the authentication and then the, the this extension does attestation yes so this extension would allow the attestation of both sides basically yes. a client can attest okay. uh, and server can attest yeah okay and this so this is in addition all of this is in addition to the authentication provided by tls absolutely yes thank you yeah, go ahead. Nancy's on the queue. <laughs> I was going to go to the mic, but I'm going to save myself time. So, um, Yogesh, is it that you're proposing that an attestation actually get carried inside the certificate? Um, we're defining a new certificate which carries the attestation evidence, but the protocol is such that we can carry that next to the X.509 certificate as an extension. So, so kind of along the same lines, when you say yeah. it's bilateral attestation, yeah, is it a requirement that you have to have bilateral authentication in order to have bilateral attestation? No, it is not a requirement. This is a feature which which lets you do that. It is not. We are not saying that you have to do mutual. It's based on what topology and in what scenario you want to use this feature. It depends on that. Does okay. that answer your question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, that answers it. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so next slide, please. So maybe we need to click a couple of more times. Yes. So yeah. So this is the kind of um, the kind of uh, arrangement we have. This arrangement highlights uh, the kind of concept we are trying to establish here is the attester generating um, the platform attestation token and then the same root of trust having a key um, and that which is signing the workload identity key the and the workload identity keys proof of possession and it is in the secure state is the is is established through the key attestation token and there is a some degree of binding between the platform attestation token and the key attestation token which is expressed as a combined attestation bundle which is exchanged as evidence between the attester and the relying and the verifier. Yeah. Next slide, please. So I'm going to kind of briefly run through with three slides a kind of flow, which is how uh, this. I don't want to go too much detail here because I'm aware of the conscious of the time. Feel free to reach out to me into a. a understand this a bit more in detail but this ex this basically tries to highlight the kind of um, extensions we want to embed within the existing tls handshake to make this work so we know all know that uh, the tls 1.3 this is predominantly for tls 1.3 and not for tls 1.2 so the client exchanges a client hello message and in that we we kind of um, the client exp expresses by the way, here I'm trying to show you a, um, a model where the client is the attester and the server is the relying party. And we are trying to express a background check model of flow here. So this is the initial setting scene on which this flow is based. 
but we can always flip the roles but that is not the intent here for this particular message sequence so the client generates a um, client hello message to start the exchange and here it it basically in the evidence proposal extension it shows it expresses what uh, types of evidences it support it may support more than one so it says x a b c and then potentially uh, verifier queries um, establishes a new session in the verifier to understand what type of evidence formats the verifier supports and what evidence formats the server can subsequently handle and then it expresses that in the server hello message uh, but precisely through the encrypted extensions it basically the uh, communication with the verifier is to acquire the challenge for the exchange and the supported uh, evidence formats and that is communicated in the encrypted extensions message to the client and once both have a matching um, uh, evidence uh, format they can proceed with the exchange so that's that's the next slide please and so mm, the server issues a certificate request message which uh, and and the, as subsequent to that the client um, establishes the proof of possession by generating um, evidence which is a combined evidence which has nonce received from the server and um, it generates a combined attestation bundle and it sends that in the certificate message and then subsequently it establishes the proof of possession of the key by signing the uh, uh, signature sig and then reporting it in the certificate verify message and it has as you can see the evidence is reported in the conceptual message wrapper which we use which uh, hank has already discussed about that so russ has a question i'm happy to answer russ he's getting there hi uh, russ housley i'm a little bit confused what's going on here um yeah if the uh, new certificate format um, yeah in the TLS sense, right, um, yeah. Yeah. is used in lieu of X509, the yeah. finished message is going to contain a signature. Um, so I don't see how you're getting the authentication if you're signing only with something that's related to the attestation. I think the, um, the certificate verify SIG um, needs to be verified by the server, right? Maybe I, I didn't understand your question fully. Maybe we can... Uh, I, I I can check and get back to you. Basically, is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the next slide, please. So once the um, relying party or the server receives the uh, evidence, it exchanges uh, the evidence. It sends the conceptual message wrapped evidence into the verifier and verifier receives an attestation result in the attestation result it it gets the attestation key it gets the uh, attestation key uh, as an augmented um, um, uh, claim extension claim set because the evidence ha has the key and it, it, it can uh, once the attestation is complete that is um, um, posted in the attestation result extension and then the, the key is then used to verify the signature on the SIG reported in the certificate verify message. The verify AR is basically here is the uh, verification of attestation result using the verifier public key. That is the step one needs to do before verifying the contents, uh, before extracting the contents from the attestation results. The um, yeah, and the attest it is expected that the server fetches the public key of the verifier using uh, a separate uh, API from the verifier. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mike. Mike Answorth and Trust. Can you go back one slide? Yeah. So that that line there, SIG certificate conceptual message wrapper, is that yeah. you putting it? 
I, I'm confused. Are you putting evidence yeah. inside the certificate? The certificate no, carries the evidence as a conceptual message wrapper. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Is, certificate is that, extension. Inside... Extension. So, so the CA needs to sign over the CMW, which contains the evidence. No, it is just passed. Um, I don't think the certificate, uh, the CMW itself, is is transported as is. The server just extract the certificate uh, CMW and passes it to the verifier. So it's in a certificate extension, but not signed. The the CMW uh, the evidence is signed by the uh, attestation key from the server from the so you have to take it out of the cert before you validate the TBS. Sorry, you have to you have to extract that extension out before you validate the signature on the certificate. I think the outer signature on the certificate is well, maybe I, I sorry I confused you. I think the certificate message would have the that is the conventional thing which you do in the TLS how you extract the certificate. The extension is not separately signed. That is just passed as is to the verifier. Oh, do you mean you mean a TLS extension on the certificate message? Yes. Not a yes. X509 V3 extension inside. No. Okay, I will sit down now. Dave, yeah. So I was trying to find the answer, but I figured I'd bring it up at the mic. So it's, whatever the answer is, it's in the minutes, but I, I wasn't able to find it in time. Um, People keep saying putting the evidence in there. Um, if that's true, then this is only going to work for the background check model. And so why would you not want it to be an attestation payload, which could be evidence or attestation results, so it would work for both models? Yeah, why yeah, yeah. As I mean, evidence? No, no, no. As I said, this is not showing both the models. Yeah. We are going yeah. to, this is only showing one concept, which is working in our so don't don't just say that I'm only yeah. putting evidence. Yes, attestation result is another use case which we are going to validate and test. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The, the intent is for the draft to cover both, right? Or, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yes, next. So there is please. a case using dice certificates where evidence can exist in the certificate, and a embedded and certificate authority could dynamically create or generate the certificate with evidence. So both. So that's one case. The other case is essentially an attribute certificate that's signed dynamically by something, a certificate. Uh, and that that uh, attribute certificate or token or you know, signed document, whatever, could contain evidence that's also dynamically obtained. Yeah, I just want to it's make sure that we're also considering the case where a tested TLS is using a passport. Yes, passport is considered. Sorry, I, I got confused because they. Um, Ned, what exactly is your question? Are you say is both use cases supported? Both the type of certificate supported, or I, I'm Sorry, saying I that, that uh, there are a variety of different ways to do this in the industry, and yes. this proposal should acknowledge what all of those different ways are and address the yeah. the, the requirements. Sure. Yeah. Accepted. Yeah. Okay. So now with a chair hat on, it seems that there are relevant use cases. Uh, it seems yes. that the draft and discussion isn't clear enough yet and requires some work, especially based on this feedback. So my recommendation is to go back, take in this feedback, consult the interested parties, uh, people who have mentioned doing similar work. And I think in that regard, you'll wind up addressing Russ's question earlier by looking at these other use cases designed within other standards bodies. Um, after you get to that phase, my recommendation would be to present this within the TLS working group. And I would wait until you are that refined so that it is clear within that group where you might not be hitting attestation experts. So uh, get it further along work with those in this community who are interested, um, look at the similar works specified, and um, you can float it back on this mailing list to make sure you've, you've dotted all your I's and crossed your T's. And then it does need to go to TLS as well. 
I think uh, just to clarify, we have shared this work item with TLS as well last time. So we haven't okay. edited much on the draft as of this between last session and this session because we are focusing on proof of concept of what we have so documented so far in the document. So we okay. have not presented this time explicitly with the TLS, but the group of TLS group is already been notified and, okay. uh, and they are aware of this. Okay, so what I'm saying is you're going to get better feedback from them if you shore up the document based on the feedback here. Because some in the room there might not have been fully aware of your use cases or um, you know, some of the details like Russ's question, which would have been addressed with some of these other explorations that Ned and Dave had suggested. So you'll get better feedback sure. in TLS if you do this pre-work first. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to continue or? Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah. So can I get to the um, uh, next slide, please? It's coming. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, this slide highlights what um, what rats. Um, drafts we have used in our uh, basically the draft also covers these um, uh, references to these um, rats existing drafts and documents and we have used them extensively in our prototype which is we have used corim to provision uh, endorsements into the verifier and then we have used conceptual message wrapper to wrap the evidence so that the uh, the the evidence just blindly translates, uh, seamlessly translates without any modification in any of the wrapped protocol between a tester and the relying party. And then we have used uh, EAR, eat based attestation results to be translated, uh, received from between verifier and the relying party. So mm, this is just a highlight of usage of RATS documents. Yeah. Next slide, please. Sorry, Dave, you have a question here. Yeah. I was just going to ask if you could say something about the uh, rightmost vertical line since there's no labels on that one. Yeah, basically what we are, this is what it's showing is that the reference value provider or an endorsement provider also has to provision similar um, or a matching um, credentials at the factory provisioning of the attester. So we didn't, didn't deliberately want to kind of uh, go deeper into that subject. But if uh, say example, an attestation key is burnt in a device at the factory, then the private key is sealed in the attest attester and the same pub associated public key or the trust anchor is provisioned via Corim to the verifier. So that's the dotted line uh, is the intention of the, that dotted line. Yeah. Hank, you have a question here. Okay, I think, yeah. I think we can move on to the next slide if there are no more questions. Yeah, so these are the um, uh, uh, drafts which we have used. So this is just um, what is the purpose of each draft. And the work item drafts are the attestation in TLS and DTLS. Um, this defines the TLS extensions and how to use them in attestation during the TLS handshake. And then there is a, a token format, the evidence format, general principles, which are in the second um, row of this table, each based key attestation token. This is again a draft. And the rest of all are the known drafts to the RATS working group. So I won't go into detail of CMW eat collection types. Well, eat collection types is basically um, a draft which is describing the collection, um, eat collection, uh, collection type, uh, which is still in a draft state. And the rest uh, we have pretty covered, pretty much covered earlier. So I would move on to the next slide, please. So uh, this this slide basically we want to highlight um, that this is a community effort. It is not just uh, one organization promoting this. So specifications are also being contributed by community members. Some of them have objections naming their organization names. So we've just keep kept it broad. And um, Tew Dresden and um, has kindly accepted to do the formal verification of the specifications, which is not yet done but it is something which uh, is planned in the near future. 
and the implementation prototype has also been uh, contributed by members from uh, communities so multiple contributors are there in the implementation as well in addition to the specification work yeah next slide please so this basically um, now i'm going going to the bit of the kind of proof of concept which we have validated based on this uh, the draft uh, principles so this shows the highlight of the uh, prototyping architecture where the tester or the client also has a embed tls stack and uh, the server is the one which receives the evidence or in the other way around in the model it could be the attestation results also and then the evidence is exchanged with the verifier which here is shown as version which does the attestation evidence uh, appraisal and then returns uh, attestation results which are then used to uh, to establish the trustworthiness of and the use of the key so that's the high level flow uh, next slide please and these are the main open source repositories which we we have if anybody is interested in collaborations we are happy to um, uh, collaborate and move improve this uh, proof of concept or any other attestation format they want to introduce in here they are welcome to do that and um, the root repository is the ccc attested tls proof of concept repository which is um, which is under the github of ccc and um, which we have a now a working proof of concept where there is a relying party there is an attester and then there is a verifier running in a dockerized environment attest uh, exchanging the evidence which is a combined evidence of key attestation and platform attestation and then the key is valid verified and is extracted in the attest from the attestation result and is used in the exchange and the rest all are the uh, other libraries which are used in other parts of the con components like parsec is used as a platform abstraction library for generating a uniform attestation token from the attester and of course verizon is used as an at for attestation verification and we use c token and tcoze which are known in the public known public repositories for um, evidence construction and uh, wrapping them using cozy library so next slide please so i think i have already covered uh, about the proof of concept we have a tpm based um, a tester um, uh, proof of concept already working and we are working on arm cca based platform um, and key attestation where a key is produced in a arm cca realm and that has been attested by version as which which could attest the key generated in the realm and a platform which is a realm and a workload uh, a workload running on a cca platform that could be a, can be attested and the results uh, attestation results used by the relying parties so that is a work in progress and we are actively working on that and lastly i would like to say that um, any other community members wishing to um, wishing to contribute with us they are most welcome to join the ccc attestation sig and uh, we are welcome welcoming outside contributors to work and improve the draft and the proof of concept and try new attestation formats as i mentioned yes we have only verified and validated um, background check model so we would be working on the rats passport based model and a poc poc proof of concept based on the passport model yeah thank you so much i think that's that brings an end to my presentation Thank you. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I think that's it for our agenda. Uh, we do have a few minutes for open mic time. Dave, you're on the queue. Two short topics. Um, they'll cover one at a time. Um, and so if somebody else has a question, you can put them in between. So my first question is, uh, you know, looking at, say, uh, the long line of uh, stuff that Hank did, the, the common thread was uh, ready for working group last call. And so if there's like five, I don't know what the number is, 
let's say there's a bunch of doc two. There's two. Okay. My question is, uh, are we going to run the working group last calls in parallel or in series? I was going to run them in parallel. Do you have a preference? If the number is more than two then running them in series means that you're going to get fewer reviewers of each one. Sorry, running them in parallel means you're going to get fewer reviewers of each one, right? Because you're splitting your efforts across those and people only have, only have so many cycles within, say, the summer periods between now and September or whatever. Well, okay. Yeah, given uh, the summertime, I was yeah. going to give them four to six weeks. So okay. the, yeah, the two, that's fine. The, yeah. the two yeah. that um, are ready are the media types and the yeah. UCCS yeah. ones, yeah. right? So, I mean, they're yeah. relatively small okay. in comparison no, if, to... If you have, only two, and you say yeah. they're four week periods, and running them in parallel is fine. I, I just came up in in suit where we have the number is more than two, and we're doing some in a uh, series, right? Dave's nodding because he's the one that was talking about this in the suit working group, right? For this reason to get more eyes on each one um, rather than saying, well, I'm going to look at this one, and then I'm off the hook because I've looked at this one instead of that one, right? And so we were doing it in parallel. But if you only got two and you got four weeks, I think that's fine, so. No other topics, I'll ask my other easy question. Okay. Sure. Um, uh, in the, the, Nancy, in the uh, TEEP working group, the question came up about, uh, you know, we want more interoperability testing and so on. And so the TEEP working group was saying, so should we have like an interim or some interop event or whatever? And so uh, Dave Waltermeyer and I said, well, you know, we're looking at having a suit interim in September. And uh, there's so much interaction between TEEP and SUIT that, you know, maybe we should just use that date to uh, have people talk about the relationship, you know, the use of TEEP in, in, in the SUIT working group, which is using the stuff, right? Um, now, SUIT and RATS don't directly use each other. However, TEEP uses both of them. And so that's why I'm looking at uh, Nancy and not Dave. Um, that says, okay, is there anything that would be interesting in the mid-September time frame and the implementation of this to say, you know, TEEP use of, uh, of uh, rats or something like that. And so I just want to raise this issue in case there's people that would have something to report in that time frame. So, and I don't know if Dave is going to shoot me now, but. Uh... Well, I was trying to clarify to Dave, it was just the one <laughs> for, for TEEP's yeah. use of the suit manifest, but. Um... Yeah, well. There's no, there's TEEP's use of, there's normative dependencies from the TEEP protocol for, yes. okay, outside the scope of RATS, okay, just like the off topic here, there's normative references on like four different suit documents, right? One is the suit manifest, which is, you know, already there, but then the other ones that are still going through working up last call. And so we wanted some potentially experience with any of those or whatever, right? But you can make the same argument about, well, you know, TEEP normatively references each or whatever, right? And so is there anything to report on of, say, somebody else's implementation of, you know, the eat spec or somebody that says, we want to use something other than that, like we're going to make it work with, you know, SGX reports or whatever else. And having that report might be interesting and the taste having visibility among the rats people if there's going to be anything in that time frame. So that's what I was going to ask. Is there any implementers? And this may be the wrong place to ask it, but I at least want to give visibility here in open mic. So. No, I think that's much appreciated. Uh, Dave Waltermeyer, we can certainly share the info for um, for the interim that we're going to have. Uh, so if anyone wants to come and, yeah. and present, yeah, that would be that would be fine. My only concern is we probably have a lot of business to cover, and we don't want to jam right. the agenda, you know, too full. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it it would be more the question of do do we need to have a coincident meaning extend the time. Right, that would be a, a separate one. But so, Dave, I'm thinking it may be worthwhile for either you, maybe Dave. Which Dave? Oh, sorry, Dave, Thaler. <laughs> I'm looking at Thaler <laughs> to post both on the Teep and the Rats, um, because I just know it's you and Kohei and Akita who are doing the interop for all the three, right? So it may be worthwhile for you to post on both the TEEP and the RATS to see if there's others that are doing implementations that would be useful to do the reports, right? Yeah. I think she was asking you, Dave. Yeah, I, I was looking at failure. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm only looking at you because we haven't chosen a specific <laughs> date for the interim yet. And I'm, I'll, Russ is also hiding in the back of the room here. Um, we haven't chosen a specific date. 
And so when choosing the date, we'd probably want to optimize for the primary suit participants, but uh, give visibility to uh, maybe uh, TEEP and then indirectly to rats only because it's, uh, it's right. not directly related, it's indirectly related only insofar as TEEP is related, right? So. Well, so, so hold on. Blood. So my suggestion, since this is, we need to bring it back to rats. Um, so what we had agreed, what Dave Waltemeyer and I had agreed was that we could try and put dates on the doodle poll that would work at least for the, the two groups chairs, right? Um, and then I think if you can post to the teep and rats, we can gauge the interest and then maybe run, and my suggestion is that we would run a separate doodle poll that we could choose based on that and then the rats chairs, right? So it, it could be either coincident or after that one yeah. is what I'm suggesting. Right? That sounds fine with me. Yeah, yeah, because I don't want to overload the interdependencies, right? right. Yep. right. Yeah. So, okay. So I was going to summarize, we've got Two working group last call documents, the media types and the U UCS. Hank is going to continue to mature, well, and the authors, the co-rim draft. Um, the EPOC markers, we're going to revisit on the interim with COSI, Hank. Yeah. Um, the conceptual message wrapper, I think, needs more review. Um, Sorry for interrupting you. Um, no, that's fine. Um, I, I think I will start that discussion on the email list already. Yes. So I'm not waiting for the interim. That might just delay things too much because I think it might also be a relatively short discussion. That's fair. OK. I, I'm just trying to give a summary since I think this is the first time in the RATS ITF session where I actually get to summarize what transpired. Um, Dave Thaler, I think you've got direction and co-authors for the endorsements sets. Um, and then you guess you're going to continue with the attended TLS maturing that, that work as well. So I think we actually are making good progress. EAT is kind of getting on its way, right, Roman? That is awesome. Awesome work. Eat authors. I'm looking at Lawrence. Um, so unless there's any other business going once, going twice, going thrice, I think we may be done. Thank you all. This is good work. Huh? Thank, thank you to the notes and, takers. And thank you to Mike and AJ for the notes. OK, so. The last bit you did was hard to summarize. <laughs> uh, are you doing it on hedge doc? Yes. Okay, I can just add them in there. So, sorry, I was trying to go fast. Thank you. So. We have to massage that anyway. So, so we we have to take the notes and clean it up in there. So, but very much appreciate it. Yes. 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 Yes.